Daunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we've got a special interview for you. We have Christian author, counselor, and lecturer, John Eldridge. Yes, we got John Eldridge on the podcast. I know a lot of you guys have been asking about getting him on the show, and we were able to finally make that happen. If you're not familiar with John Eldridge, he is the New York Times bestselling author of a large number of books, workbooks, and group studies. He has a new bestseller that just came out here recently called Get Your Life Back, Everyday Practices for a World Gone Mad. And this book, it couldn't be more timely with all this COVID-19 stuff going on and all the craziness with the news and your smartphones. And it's just, it's a perfect time for this book. And it's gotten more and more perfect over time, especially with the stuff that we're dealing with. But most of you guys are going to know him from his seminal work, the, the really the seminal men's ministry book, Wild at Heart. And so we go into a lot of detail on Wild at Heart in this podcast. Again, that book is almost 20 years old, if you can believe it. We also spend some time talking about another book that a lot of you guys have asked me about, and that's Beautiful Outlaw. That book kind of gets into the personality of Jesus and understanding kind of the fullness of who he is. And guys, he's got a lot of other books too. Maybe you've read Fathered by God or Desire or and maybe even Stacy Eldridge, his wife uh, wrote a book called Captivating. They actually wrote that book together. Maybe your wife has gone through that. But this is a guy that has had a tremendous impact on men's ministry in the United States. And his book, Wild at Heart, that's, that's kind of the thing that has, you know, lit this fire under so many guys. It, it's kind of hard. You can see I'm kind of struggling with the words. It, it's hard to even describe the fullness of the impact that he's had just with his ideology and his philosophy on how to do things. So we go into a lot of different subject matters. We talk about rites of passage. We talk about so many different things in this interview. I'm so excited for you guys to listen to it. Again, pay attention to the notes at the end in the show notes. I've got the links for you, but guys, without further ado, let's get into it. John Eldridge, welcome to Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Thanks, Kyle. Great to be with you. Well, I'm so happy to have you on this podcast. A lot of guys are very, very excited to hear about this interview. You've got a lot of fans on this uh, interview, a lot of fans of this show. And so we're just going to launch right in and we'll start just from the beginning with you. Uh, just briefly, before you were a Christian, you said that you spent a lot of time digging into some Eastern religions, some of the more mysticism, new age, spirituality, those types of things, but that it was the writings of Francis Schaeffer, who's a kind of a modern philosopher that helped lead you to Christ. And so that, to, to me and to my audience, that's a fairly unique story that, you know, a philosopher's writings uh, would have led you out of kind of that mysticism and new age spirituality. Can you brief, briefly give us an idea of kind of how all of that went down, how you went from some of those other thoughts on religion and kind of went, making your way all the way to Christ? Yeah, I was hungry. Uh, I was uh, in my teenage years uh, in high school and right out of high school, I was searching and I, I tried everything. I looked into Native American spirituality and Eastern mysticism, New Age. Um, I was looking for the truth. I wasn't looking for a religion. I, I wasn't really even looking for an experience. I wanted to know what was true. And I knew that if I ever found it, it would be globally true. Like it would, it would be true for the arts and for culture and the sciences and psychology. Like if there is a truth, about humanity, it's got to apply to every part of life. And that was Schaefer's belief. He, he really did a good job presenting to that generation that Christianity is not a religion, it's a worldview. And when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he means it. So I had, I had a, actually a pretty beautiful, intimate encounter with Jesus Christ when I was 18. And uh, I didn't have anybody share the gospel with me. I grew up in an agnostic home. Uh, but I had a very intimate encounter with Jesus, kind of like Paul on the Damascus Road without the blinding, and uh, changed my life forever. Well, the great thing uh, about that story is you hear a lot of people's Kind of, kind of come to Jesus, Jesus moment for a lot of folks isn't the same. And some people think there has to be some dramatic story attached to it, which isn't always the case, but then that is also a possibility. But it's really interesting to hear about how you came to faith. But certainly your faith, it undergirds just about everything that you've put out. You've authored a lot of best-selling books. And even here recently, you've got another bestseller called Get Your Life Back, Everyday Practices for a World Gone Mad. And that's something that you just released here recently. But I just want you to say in your own words, Describe this book and what is Get Your Life Back about and why did you write it for a time such as this time? Well, it's it's wild, Kyle, because 
if you pick it up and read it, you would think that I wrote it during the pandemic. Right. Um, but I didn't. I, I God just knew that folks were going to need this. Um, prior to the pandemic, I, I've been a Christian therapist for 30 years and I'm just noticing the effect of the world on my own soul and on the soul of the people I care about. Everybody was flying, everybody was spun up, everybody was running, had, it was a, it was a perfect storm. It was the pace of life. It was the number of things that had to get done. It, and then it was the overburden of technology. We are just way too plugged in, you know, 10 hours a day on our phones and three hours a day using apps. And it was, and then it was the, the chaos of the world, right? You, you've got the global news coming to you every day. And uh, I didn't like what it was doing to me. I didn't, I felt like I, I, I wasn't a human anymore. Right. I, I was asking myself to live at the speed of a smartphone. So I wrote the book talking about ways that I had begun to get my life back from the crazy. I mean, everybody has a crazy day. Everybody's got a crazy week. But when it starts turning into crazy life, that's not good. And, uh, and then the pandemic hits. And, you know, if you were on, if you were glued to the news before the pandemic, you, you put that on jet fuel. Right, and if if you were spun up on spo- social media, I mean, you were glued to it. So suddenly, here during the pandemic, with all this uncertainty, and and with all this loss, I mean, there's just a lot of genuine loss. People losing their jobs, their companies, churches closing. Um, I think that God knew we needed we needed soul care. You know, we didn't need to binge watch Netflix three hours a day during the quarantine. We needed soul care. And so the book is designed around how beauty and nature and and music and, and simply learning to pause in your day, like setting a rhythm of wholeness would really bring about um, strong and healthy souls. And, and uh, like I said, you know, we needed that before the pandemic, but holy cow, do we need it now? When I think a lot of people are struggling with that as they're sitting in kind of this milieu of confusion and just they can't really turn to their pastors because they can't go to church and they can't really turn to their boss because they can't go to work. And there's this confusion that is set in for a lot of people. And we're certainly not here to debate what the government dictates have been, but it has caused a lot of issues. And so there couldn't be a better time to have a book like this. But before we we move on from Get Your Life Back, I did want to ask a very specific question about kind of the, the tone and tenor of the book. So you've said that you want the content of Get Your Life Back to help people learn how to live freely and lightly. So freely and lightly. And so what's interesting about that is when I heard you say that, it was in some interview somewhere, it kind of landed funny with me. Um, And I guess the the question is, is why would you encourage a man to live lightly? Because in in light of a lot of the other works that you've done, Wild at Heart, which we'll talk about, and and Fathered by God and all these other ones, it seems like you want men to live with, you know, resilience and heft and to to run into some, some, uh, you know, obstacles that they have to overcome. So so why would you encourage freeness in kind of this light weightiness? Yeah. Yeah, it's probably a uh, vernacular. It's probably just word choice. Um, you're probably hearing um, goofy and irresponsible, um, which I don't mean by those words. Uh, one of the things that happened in, in the last 30 years was the human soul got inundated with the cares of the world. I mean, you, you just open your phone in the morning And here's the wildfires in Australia. 1.9 billion animals died. Right. And 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 the earthquakes in Turkey. And and the thing is, First Peter five, verse seven says, "Cast all your cares upon the Lord, because He cares for you." And and then Jesus's invitation is, "Take my yoke, because my yoke is easy, my burden is light." Basically, what I'm trying to contrast, Kyle, is the world hammers your soul, and the world asks men to carry burdens that actually aren't ours to carry. And and learning which are ours to carry and which are not is a really important step towards maturity. 
Uh, and so, yeah, the invitation, because the, the bottom line is you can't sink the lifeboat. Like every family, every household is a lifeboat. And you can't throw so much need into that that it sinks. You, you've got to have a resilient ship so that you can live strong, offer well, you know, live out your calling, follow God. But most of what I see is people way spun up in the world and and now, right? Like way spun up in what's the economy going to do? What's the pandemic going to do? Are they going to ease the restrictions? Right, right. And, and you're actually not supposed to live in that mess. There's a, there's a different life. There's a life with God. Um, now, there are battles to face, and we'll get to that in a minute. And there are hills to climb and hills to take. Uh, and there is suffering and sacrifice for men in this world who want to be men. But not the crazy of the world, not the world's version of, you know, stay plugged in and stay overcooked. That stuff is not good. Right. And I appreciate your, your clarifying on that. And that's an interesting point as well, because for a lot of guys, they don't really have that internal maturity to delineate, uh, you know, left or right on, on an issue like that. And so, so guys, that's just a primer for the rest of the book, get your life back. And certainly there will be a link in the show notes so that you can go and pick that up. But we're going to transition now into the book that you're probably most known for, certainly to my audience. And that's a book you released back in 2001. And that's wild at heart. And so I've said multiple times on this podcast and uh, when I I've been speaking that this is the seminal men's ministry book. And I will debate that to the ends of the earth, that I think this is the most important, the most seminal men's ministry book that we have. And so for you, I guess it's interesting when you're writing a book, You, I guess you may not know or, or realize what type of a overall impact it's going to have. But at what point did you realize that Wild at Heart was catching fire and having a huge impact on men? Yeah, not not until really the second and third year. Um, I knew I was the guy that found treasure in the field. I knew it uh, because I I had taken a, I had taken the journey myself, and as a as a Christian therapist, I had counseled tons of guys through pretty hard stuff. And and the thing is, the core issues were always the same. You know, whether it was the sexual addiction stuff or or the gambling or, um, you know, depression, anxiety, you know, suicide, the different battles of the human heart, the core issues were the same for every man I saw. And, th and then I began to read on it, research on it, write about it. I'm like, I'm like, I knew this is gold, but I didn't know, you know, uh, if the world would know, I didn't know if guys would take the time. Uh, to read it. And then when we watched, we watched the revolution begin to take off. And, and uh, early on, yeah, it's phenomenal, Kyle, just the beauty of what's happened around the world through that message. A lot of guys healed, a lot of marriages rescued, and it's still going strong. I mean, it's, it's still uh, healing a lot of masculine souls because like you said, there's not a lot else out there that goes by the way of the heart. There's a lot of instruction on how to get your act together, but it's trying to fix a man from the outside. Uh, you know, here are the things you ought to do to become a good man. And much of it's good stuff, but the problem is if you don't go by way of the heart, if you don't resurrect and restore and strengthen and train the masculine soul, then he can't, he can't run that marathon, right? He's still got a broken leg. Absolutely. And I like your vernacular that you use there of training the masculine soul. There is some work that needs to be put in and there's some sort of revelatory things that you need to be able to understand in order to get to that point. And guys, this book has been out for a long time. Can you believe it? Almost 20 years. And so we're certainly not going to get into all the details and the themes of this book, but I did want to read uh, one quote to you, John. This is actually my favorite quote from the entire book. And if I had to give somebody one paragraph, from this entire book to kind of sum up why it's important to me, it would be this. So indulge me as I read it. We don't need accountability groups. We need fellow warriors, someone to fight alongside, someone to watch our back. A young man just stopped me on the street to say, I feel surrounded by enemies and I'm all alone. 
The whole crisis in masculinity today has come because we no longer have a warrior culture, a place for men to learn to fight like men. We don't need a meeting of really nice guys. We need a gathering of really dangerous men. That's what we need. Yes, we need men to whom we can bear our souls, but it isn't going to happen with a gr group of guys you don't trust who really aren't willing to go to battle with you. It's a long-standing truth that there is never a more devoted group of men than those who have fought alongside one another, the men of your squadron, the guys in your foxhole. It will never be a large group, but we don't need a large group. We need a band of brothers willing to shed their blood with us. And so I love that so much because I've taken that to heart and I've got a group of guys that I would say is my foxhole. And I talk about the concept of the foxhole a lot, but even in reading that out loud, John, that doesn't feel like anything I hear inside the church. It doesn't feel like, you know, we've gotten this, we've gotten this schedule of this is how you act like a man. And this is a schedule with which you accomplish that. Here are the things that make you a really nice guy, but it also makes you a soft guy. So, so for you, in light of writing something like that, do you see that in the church today? Do you see that in modernity with men? Is that even important to most guys or are we still struggling? Well, two, two things are going on. Um, and one is bad news and one is really good news. The, the bad news is when I wrote Wild at Heart, there was a lot of gender confusion in the world. And in the 20 years since, there has been total gender collapse. Uh, gender is, is a spectrum. Uh, it's not even, it's not, it, it's not something that's seen with dignity and, and power, both male and female, like Genesis 1. Uh, there's so much gender fallout now that most, most younger men don't know if they're supposed to be men. Right. Uh, and, and so that's the bad news. The good news is this, though. Something really extraordinary has taken place all over the world. And your podcast is a great example of it. Guys are, guys are standing up. Guys want, guys want in. They really do. They, they are forming groups, missions, uh, you know, fellowships, retreats, outings, father, son, initiation stuff all over the place. And it's this big untold story. And it's awesome. I don't want this story story told that can wait for the kingdom the the cool thing is there is this grassroots i i, I don't even know what to call it it's like a wildfire going on and, and it's not just in in north america it is it is all over the world there is a resurgence now it's it's the few and it's the remnant you know it's not the main thing that's taking place in church but it is taking place and it is very encouraging well, and that that's good to to see someone like you that has the perspective of timing. I mean, you've spent multiple decades looking at this, but really you've kind of really been in the fight with both feet for the last 20 years because of Wild at Heart. But you talked about the difference in the timing of early 2001. I, I can't even recognize that time period. And if you look back, John, to 2016, 2017, I don't even recognize what the world looks like now based on just a few years ago. Right. Some things right. that are happening now culturally are just they're astonishing to see the the speed with which we've, quote unquote, progressed. But the last question here on Wild at Heart before we move forward is if you wrote Wild at Heart today, as opposed to back in 2001 and, and you did do a revised and updated version about 10 years after you did the initial release, what would be different if you were writing it today? Well, it's so fascinating that you asked me that question, because we are actually re-releasing Wild at Heart next year with a big a big push to reach a new group of men. And so I had to do that exact project. Oh, wow. Okay. Last, in the last month, I had to go through the book with a fine tooth comb and read every word. And and I hadn't read it in years personally, you know, because I don't sit there and read my own books. But, <laughs> right. um, but as I read through it, I was stunned at how timeless the message is. I made very few changes. Um, but but the fun the fun part B of the answer to your question, Kyle, is if I would if I was trying to equip guys to handle the war in the world today, the war for their soul, their war for their relationships, the war for their dreams, all of it, I would write "Get Your Life Back," and I would stick it in the back of Wild at Heart. 
because because the main you know the scripture says there's three three great enemies the world the flesh and the devil and i think we've got a pretty good idea what the flesh is about we know what that internal traitor keeps trying to do to us and we have some sense of of what the enemy's doing um the accusations the hatred you know um but the world is such a vague concept most guys have no idea how it is sucking them dry and and they've got to be prepared uh, because this world is designed to wear you out, wear you down, and then take you out with some kind of, you know, seduction, temptation, addiction, whatever. And and if you are not clear on how the world is warring against your soul, it's just going to happen. You're, it, it's going to happen. It's going to take you out. And so get your life back. You know, I'm just... I, I'm I'm connecting the two books for a moment to go. If you want to win, you know, the fight for your life, you have got to know how to keep the world from draining you so that the, you can go then, you know, find the battles that are yours to fight and the adventures that are yours to live and love the woman in your life. And, you know, so you can go live the things I wrote about in Wild at Heart because the world the world is a perfect storm to just fry you. And the interesting thing about that, John, as well, is you bring up a great point and that that's so funny that the timing worked out to where you just got through going through that because my foxhole group of guys, we get together every Sunday, we train jujitsu and we read books. We just reread Wild at Heart. That's kind of one of the basic core curriculum books that we read. And I do remember whenever we said we were going to read it again, most people, myself included, we kind of rolled our eyes, not because we don't like the book, but, but we were like, we already know this book. We already know yeah. everything about this book. Like it is what it yeah. is. And then we were about a chapter in and we're like, oh, this is super applicable now too. And oh, look at all the stuff that I forgot. And so I think that's what's what's so timeless about that book is because it reveals something extra special that maybe we didn't know that we were missing. And that kind of dovetails nicely into the, the next book I want to talk to you about, another book that is a favorite of our listeners. And that's Beautiful Outlaw, the book that you wrote back in 2011. And so seemingly your goal with Beautiful Outlaw is to really reveal Jesus's personality, but also his humanity to people for perhaps the first time in their lives. Um, and I think that's an accurate way to describe your book. But even in the first chapter, you talk about how the version of Jesus that we're force fed, uh, the, basically just the loving and compassionate Jesus, those are great qualities. But it, you know, you say it's like trying to fall in love with a get well card. It's like you, you can't really wrap your arms around it. It's like trying to grab a fistful of water. And, but that's the only Jesus that anyone's ever given. So to transition to Beautiful Outlaw, why write a book that's focused on the personality of Jesus when everyone else just wants to focus on the stories in the gospel and read them just plain text? Yeah, because if you don't have the personality of Jesus, reading the gospels is like, it's like watching a movie with the sound turned off. You, you don't you don't get it. You're like, why does he do this stuff? What does he mean by that? Like what? And, and you're missing this phenomenal man. You're missing his sense of humor. Jesus has a great sense of humor and it's right there in the gospel stories, but we miss it because we, we've got all this religious drapery around it. Like let, let, let's back up to the biggest possible perspective for a moment that the world is at war and the human heart is the prize. If you want a worldview, a scriptural worldview in one sentence, that's it. The world is at war, the human heart is the prize. The evil one and God are fighting for the hearts and souls of men and women. And, and the rescue is Jesus. The intervention, literally the healing of your humanity, not just your ticket to heaven, because that's not even where you spend eternity, by the way. Like even that's been jacked. But um, the new heavens and the new earth, the incredible promise that's in front of us, but, but you, the rescue of your humanity right here, right now, the purpose of your life, why you're, why you're created, the healing of your soul, all of that takes place as your life is hooked up to the life of Jesus. I am the vine, you are the branch. Okay, you got to be hooked up to the life of Jesus. Now, the problem is, there. therefore, we're at this 30,000, 60,000 foot view. Therefore, the enemy 
for centuries has been clouding and veiling the world's perspective of Jesus so effectively, I might add, that most people are not that stoked about him, right? right. It's like, sure. well, well, yeah, I mean, if, you know, I don't want to go to hell, so he's my savior, but he's not exactly somebody I want to hang out with. Um, and and when, you, when you open your life, the number of times, I'm going to tell you two quick wild stories. So I am, I am deep sea fishing down off the coast of uh, Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, a number of years ago. And I uh, was about to give up. It had been a hard day and, and was about to get up. And Jesus, I heard him speak very clearly. He says, I have a marlin for you. I'm like, what? He's like, yep, I have a marlin for you. Okay. And so we stayed out and we hit it. And sure enough, boom, man, I hook into this monster marlin. And, and it's so big, they're backing the boat up so I can take in any amount of line. Um, and and it, it's an epic, epic day. And it was like phenomenal adventure, totally nourishing for my soul. It was joy. It was beauty. And because it was Jesus. It was a life with Jesus. So a couple of years ago, we are bow hunting elk in, in, here in Colorado. And we'd been on the side of this mountain and there was this bull elk bugling down in this canyon all day. We could hear him, but we couldn't get to him. It was just too gnarly terrain. And, and so we wait, we wait, we wait for evening, hoping that he's going to pop out on this, on this meadow that we're in. And he doesn't. Um, he starts leaving and he, I, we can hear him taking his whole herd of, of cows and he's moving out of this canyon. And Jesus, I hear Jesus all of a sudden say, get in the canyon, get in the woods right now. I'm like, what? He's like, yep, get in the woods. I'm like, he's left. He's gone. I can hear him. He's, he's 500 yards away down the canyon. He's like, get in the woods. I'm like, okay. So I get in the woods and I'm literally standing now in an empty forest. There is nothing going on. It's crickets. And all of a sudden, the entire herd turns around and they start coming back up the canyon. And within about seven minutes, I am surrounded by elk. Literally, they're all around me in the woods. Epic adventures like that. Like people don't realize that's the personality of Jesus. That's what he's like. He's playful. He's generous. He's fierce. And, and he is for us. And so the reason I, I wrote the book was to show people that, like, there is a life available. There is a personhood to this man that is so incredible. You're, you're not going to have a hard time loving him or following him if you know what he's really like. And, and that's a beautiful way of describing it. I got to be honest, when I talk to my friends that have read this book as well, they have the same thought that I do, which is I've never even thought to consider the personality of Jesus. Not until I read this book, right. you know, the gospels, they're just red letters on your, on your page or, or on your screen, right? There, there's not really any of this secondary notion of, I need to really figure out like, what would, what would I be acting like? Or what would I be feeling inside if I was doing that? And one quick thing on this book that I want to get your feedback on chapter four is my favorite chapter of the book. Cause it has my favorite quote in there. And it's the chapter about his fierce intention. And you describe my favorite story in the entire Bible. This is Jesus clearing the temple in John two. And we won't spend a ton of time here, but you talk about the Jesus that's described in John 2, and then you kind of contrast that with this kind of, you know, peaceful, pacifist, tranquil Jesus that we see in a lot of modern day worship music. And to be honest, for a lot of listeners of this podcast, a lot of these guys are rough around the edges. These aren't guys that have maybe been church guys their entire life. They're not necessarily seen as nice guys. They're more so in that dangerous guys category that uh, you quoted back in Wild at, Wild at Heart. But why, why such a disconnect, especially in modern worship music? Why is it so hard for most guys to get into stuff like that? You know, wh why is the church and why does worship music, why do they keep putting out stuff like that when it's seemingly so contrary to the true full nature of who Jesus is? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Um, and what you're describing, Kyle, yep. Yep. That's the problem. Um, it, it, it has to do with the feminization of the church and by that, I don't mean feminism. I mean that, that over the years, the people that they could recruit to do anything to help in the church were women. 
the guys, the guys wouldn't show up. They didn't want to think about it. So what you ended up with over time was a, a way of doing spirituality that was very much informed by the feminine soul. And, and so you, you can so there's one observation. Now, part two is, and back to the warrior culture quote that you read from Wild at Heart, we have not created a warrior culture in the church. Now, I do want to say that's changing. There, there are churches that are doing that. And, and that's that grassroots groundswell thing I was talking about. That is changing. And it's awesome that it is. You know, and again, look at your podcast. Like there's good things going on. But for the most part, you, you, have a, you have a church that was very feminized, and then you had a church that didn't have a warrior culture. Well, what kind of worship is that going to produce? Like, you're just not going to, you, you know, you, we didn't form ministers and worship leaders in the masculine journey. Seminary has nothing to do with that. They, they, they don't know that it needs to be done. Right. And so, and all the, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just describing a reality that, that without masculine initiation, you won't have worship leaders writing different types of worship. And, and again, that's changing. And, and there are some, there are some guys out there in particular who are, who are writing some killer worship. Uh, that that's far more you know passionate and fierce. They you know they they see Jesus as a great warrior. So again, the good good news. There's there are some some of the trends are changing, but you've got to go you got to go find it because it's not the main course. Yeah, and I would certainly uh, like to get some suggestions from you as to what some of that music is, because I tell guys all the time, I was like, the majority of the music that I listen to is fairly aggressive, underground, heavy metal, a lot of which is Christian in nature. And since I was a teenager, that is something that spoke to me. It spoke to a different part of my soul than, you know, Michael W. Smith or Shane and Shane would speak to, you know. So, John, in light of some of the things that you've talked about, uh, you've talked about the importance of learning this and giving this type of a aspect to, to a lot of different types of folks and that it's not something that people are just going to pick up on. And you and I talked a little bit off air. I just had my first son. And so we actually had to move our first interview time because my son was born that day. And, and so we really appreciate you uh, moving that around with us. But my wife just gave birth to our first son and here I am. I'm so excited for him to be like 16 years old so I can be teaching him things about what it means to become a man. But what I want to know from you is you understand how we have a deficit of rites of passage in our culture. We don't really have that, certainly in modern Christian culture. You have three sons. Your kids have kids. I just had my first son. What advice do you have for fathers out there like me or the ones listening to this show for their that they're fathers of sons and they want to do rites of passage with, with their sons, what would you suggest for them to do? Well, I, um, and it may just be a language thing, but let me, let me suggest a different way of thinking about it. Your primary work is the initiation, the initiation of your son into masculinity, into manhood. That's your primary role as a dad. And, and the initiation process is something that takes place over time. Now, what happened in like the 90s and in the 2000s and, and a little bit in, in, into the decade of 2010 it is people began to rediscover the importance of like ceremony and, and you know, at, at high school graduation or at, a 16, or at a 13th birthday or 16th or at a wedding ceremony, you know, different ways speaking um, kind of uh, validation into the young man's life. And I believe in that. And I've done it for all three of my sons. And I think that's a good thing. But that's not the primary thing that's needed. What the dad does, because you got all you got, you got 365 days a year with this guy. Right. So it's not about a day or an evening. It, it's not about a ceremony. Initiation is a process that takes place over time. It's something that's age appropriate, but it basically goes like this. The boy has two needs and the needs are, does my dad adore me? Does my dad really, really adore me? And do I have 
what it takes. The, the, the answer of the core questions, the formation of courage, the formation of resolve, the formation of faith, uh, the formation of honor and character are things that take place over time. And so starting from young, you're setting the boy up. It's the, it's the wrestling on the living room floor. It's, it, it's you know the first bike rides and building courage into him. It's the trampoline and learning to do a flip. And, and it's the validation of the dad there. So that over time, as you do get into like, you know, the, the teenage years, um, then it's hard work and, and it's the formation of, of a resilience there. It's the outdoors and what the outdoors does for the soul. It's, um, you know, learning to cut wood and learning to backpack and learning how to build a fire in the wilderness. And even if the boy is not inclined in that direction, God shapes men through creation. He does not shape them through technology. Most of this cannot be done on a laptop and it can't be done using video games. Now there's, you know, there's a place for video games and they kind of develop something of the warrior heart. But what we're describing is an initiation process that takes place over time. Um, If you can get your hands on it, guys, there's a book that's out of print called The Way of the Wild Heart uh, that I wrote that describes that process. It got shortened by my publisher several years later into a really great book called Fathered by God that you can find. So, you know, try and find the way of the wild heart because it's longer and it gives you more answers. If you can't get that, get your hands on Fathered by God because it's not only does he need initiation, but you do, right? We are all still under initiation. Right. I think that's fantastic. And and it's good to kind of change the paradigm in your brain to be more of an initiation type of thing, because that's something that a lot of people ask about. One of the biggest questions I get is, Kyle, I've got sons. What do I do? How do I, how do I usher them into manhood? No one did that for me, but that's a great way of thinking about it. But John, we're up against time. So we're going to go ahead and go to our very last section of the day. So I like to ask this of a lot of the people that I talk to. It's a segment called, what would you say to someone that said, What would you say to someone that said, and it's essentially me asking you a question and you've got 30 seconds to respond to this question. So we can't get into a lot of detail. We can't go deep. It's just basically the meat and potatoes answer on a lot of different subjects. Are you up for it? Sure. All right, let's go. First one here. What would you say to someone that said the last thing men need is another guy telling them to man up? Yes and no. Yes and no. Depends on that. Um, what men need is initiation and you do need men in your life who are calling you up but who aren't leaving you alone to figure it out absolutely next question here what would you say to someone that said pastors don't need to talk about the lion of judah the lamb of god is just fine well why would the pastor take a pair of scissors to his bible it's a fair answer. It's a fair question as well. All right, we'll move on to the next one. We'll leave that one alone. What would you say to someone that said, gender exists on a spectrum, it's fluid? Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our image. And so in the image of God, he made them male and female. He created them. Gender is the core identity of the human race. Jesus affirms that in Luke chapter 19, when he says, did you not hear that in the beginning he created them male and female? There you go. Amen and amen. Next one here. What would you say to someone that said, I don't have a battle to fight? You've already lost. I'm going to make you go a little bit further on that one. <laughs> Just this is a little bit. You got another 20 seconds. Give I, me know, a little more. I know. All right. I'm going to take another 20 seconds. Okay. Um, Of course you do. Every human does. Every man does. And to think that you don't means that the enemy has already convinced you that either there is no war or that you can't handle it or that you don't have a significant role. All three are of which are lies. The scripture tells you that you live in a world at war, and that's why it tells you to armor up. All right. You can probably see these next two coming, but what would you say to someone that said, I don't have an adventure to live? Ask Jesus what he has for you. I'm dead serious. Ask him. 
Ask him what adventures he has for you this year, small and large. He has them. I guarantee it. All right. What would you say to someone that said, I don't have a beauty to rescue? Unless you have been called to a celibate uh, single life by God, you are created for deep romance, love, passion with one woman over the course of your entire life. One woman that you love for a lifetime. You're made for it. You're wired for it. My question is, what's in the way? You haven't met her. You're too scared to ask her. You don't believe you can. You've got to press into why not. All right. Last couple here, John. What would you say to someone that said, we should not be encouraging men to be masculine. Masculinity is toxic. Well, our prisons are not filled with women. So let's reframe that to say masculinity is dangerous. Yep, that's true. But so is a surgeon's scalpel. You don't make it safe by making it dull. You put it in the hands of somebody who knows how to handle it. We, we do need to acknowledge that men are profoundly broken and they do a lot of damage in the world. Most domestic violence is not committed by women either. But you don't castrate and then tell the gelding to be fruitful, to quote C.S. Lewis. We need masculine formation now more than ever. Excellent. John, last question of the day. What would you say to someone that said, other than the Bible, Wild at Heart is the most important book for Christian men to read? You, I would say you might be right. You know I'm going to make you go further than that, John. Come on, give me some more. I, I'm pushing you on the last one of the day. I'll give you a full minute for this one if you want it. Go for it. Well, the, okay. There's a lot of there's a lot of really good books out there in in the history of book production. Um, so I'm not going to put Wild at Heart at the top, but we have been describing how in the last 100 years. Since the Industrial Revolution, essentially, we have lost masculine initiation. We don't know how to initiate men anymore. And, and there is an assault on the masculine soul ever since you were a boy. So if you want your masculine heart back, and if you want some very clear direction into masculine formation, Wild at Heart would be a really good choice. I would certainly agree with that. Well, John, we really appreciate the time that you spent with us today. We've talked about a lot of different subjects, but as of right now, that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? Nope. I'd just say, guys, um, the things that you've been hearing today are probably some of the most important issues of your life. And if you've lost sight of that, I'm really glad you listened because the war is raging on the earth and you are needed. We are need good men. Absolutely. John Eldridge, thanks for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. That was my pleasure. Kyle, thanks for having me on. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed the interview. I really enjoyed my time with John. Just such a great interview. That was one I was looking forward to for a very, very long time. Again, like I said, my my wife, my lovely wife went into labor the day that I was supposed to be interviewing John. And it was just, it was a whirlwind, but we're, we're so glad we were able to work with this team to get him rescheduled very quickly. We're so happy that we had his time. Guys, before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. As you know, by now we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. Specifically, we do that by providing content like this podcast that helps you forge spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. So today, here's the links I've got for you. I've got the link to the Ransomed Heart website. That is John Eldridge's ministry. So you can get just about anything that you could want to get from John Eldridge and his team there at RansomHeart.com. I've also got specific links to three of the books that we talked about on the podcast, Get Your Life Back, Wild at Heart, and Beautiful Outlaw. And then I've got another Amazon link to all of his other books. Like I said, he's written a ton of books. He's had stuff that he's done with his wife. It's just a lot of stuff, a lot of content out there for you to consume. Also, a few other things here. I've got Life Church. That's a church that's right here in my backyard. They had John Eldridge come in and do something called Wildlife. And so I've got the links there because you can look at the different videos that he did for that. And so that was a really cool thing that was done here in the Oklahoma City community. And then also I've got a YouTube video. It's called Wild at Heart. This is an interview with John Eldridge that I thought was especially awesome. So wanted to share that with you. 
All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the podcast today. If you would, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher, and refer your friends to listen and share this on social media. Guys, if we deserve a five-star review, not four or below any of those worthless ones, five stars or more, please leave us five stars in a few sentences letting us know why you like the content. I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the remainder of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, so if you want me to come speak on your podcast, at your men's event, at your church, at your team, at your business, whatever, hit me up via email, info at undaunted.life. Again, that's I N F O at undaunted.life. The website is www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at undauntedlife or facebook.com backslash undauntedlife. Check out our free devotionals on the Uvirgin Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their entire music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song Defender, which is off their latest record entitled Guardians. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>